Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel, or welcome to the channel if you're new. My name is Doug, I'm a wildlife photographer out of Gilroy, California. In this video, we're going to review this thing right here. This is the Canon EOS R6 Mark II. I'm going to show you how to set this up for bird photography, and this is going to be a deep dive. We're going to go over all these buttons and dials. I'm going to tell you what they do. Stock settings, then I'm going to tell you how to modify them. We're going to go into the menu system here. Over 600 different menu items. Thank goodness we don't have to modify many of them, but I'll show you the key ones for birding. I'll show you how to modify them. We'll take a look at the quick menu. I'll show you how to clear some of the junk out of here, show you how this works. We're going to go back to the autofocus menu and spend a lot of time here. It's imperative, guys, that you know the difference between subject detection versus subject tracking. What's the interplay between those two? Do we need those on? And then throw I autofocus into the mix. What's the interplay between those three? And then we'll talk about these, these autofocus areas, also known as autofocus points or autofocus methods. I call them autofocus boxes sometimes because they're all boxes. What are these things? If you've ever shot a gun before or a BB gun or pellet gun, you know you have to put the sight on the target. These are sights that you have to put on the target and then pull the trigger. We don't have a trigger, but we do have a shutter button. So let's see how that works. So there's a brown and white owl there. There's my autofocus box right there. That's a medium-sized one, or that's called the single autofocus point. We'll get into all that stuff, but put it on the bird. Half press the shutter to lock it on. Make sure it's locked on. Full press to take a picture. I mean, that's the name of the game right there. And then, after you're good with the autofocus system, I will show you my settings for wildlife photography. We'll go over all the buttons and dials, the modifications, the menu, I'll show you the modifications, all in one section. And then I'll show you how to set up triple autofocus for this thing. I don't use dual back button autofocus anymore because I just get tired of hitting these little buttons with my thumb. I'd rather just half press and engage the autofocus system. And that way I can set up triple button focusing. So we'll get into all that as well. All right, guys, in this section, I'm going to do a semi-factory reset, as always, so let's go. You can jump ahead if you want. I have a full table of contents down below. So first, let's take the control dial here, and let's set that to manual. I always recommend that you shoot in full manual. I don't use any type of, I don't even use auto ISO. I just don't like it. With these mirrorless cameras, you can recover shadows so good, you don't have to use auto ISO anymore. It's not dependable for me. I just don't use it. So I recommend shooting in full manual and that's how we'll set this video up. All right, let's go take a look at the menu. We might as well talk about this now. So we have main menu icons across the top. These correspond to the main menus. Underneath each main menu, there's a bunch of numbers. Those are sub menus. Underneath each number is a sub sub menu. These are the actual menu items that we need to change. So to do a semi-factory reset, let's go over to the little camera. So here's the, let's just introduce them while we're here. Big camera, autofocus menu, play menu, connectivity menu, wrench menu, little camera menu, favorites or star menu. Let's go to the little camera, number five, clear all custom functions. So hit that or go into that. When I say that, it means tap on it and you can go into the screen or for me, I'm going to hit the set button. You can do either way. And let's go to OK. You can tap on it. I'll try to keep my hands off the viewfinder so you can see. And then click the set button. Great. Now let's go to the wrench. Let's go to number six. Let's go into the reset menu. Let's go into the basic settings menu. And let's click OK. Great. Let's go back into the menu. Back to the wrench. Back to number six back to reset camera but go down to other settings let's go into that customize quick controls got to reset that click OK shooting display don't have to worry about it root yep let's reset that great communications we're not going to worry about custom shooting modes nope not going to show you to set those up. I'm not going to show you how to set those up here copyright don't have to worry about it Customize controls, yes, we need to reset that. Great. Custom functions, definitely need to reset that. And my menu, definitely need to reset that. 
All right, guys, we have done a semi-factory reset. We are in the manual mode. We are ready to go. Let's go to the next section. All right, guys, now we're all on the same page. We have done a semi-factory reset, and you can see we have a problem here already. So the very first modification I'm going to make is to turn off all those power savings modes. I just don't like them. I've had this camera asleep when the Vermilion Flycatcher popped up in a beautiful position. I pulled up, I had about two seconds and it was asleep. It took about a second or two to wake up and the bird was gone. After that, I never use power settings. They save you maybe 15 minutes of battery life. Just take an extra battery with you. Let's turn off all the power savings settings now. Wrench number three should do the trick. Go down, power savings, and screen dimmer. Nope, set it off. And you can play with these. You can experience this yourself, but we certainly don't want this stuff powering off when I'm trying to talk to you, right? Disable. Viewfinder. Disable. Great. All the power savings modes are off. All right, before we get into the buttons and dials, let's talk about the viewfinder and the screen. This is electronic viewfinder. This is a screen, and you probably know this stuff, but electronic viewfinder is showing you what the sensor is seeing. So the sensor is, well, let me show you a sensor. Here's the RP hanging out here. I got it all ready for you. See that thing in there? That's the sensor, and I'm going to cover that back up in a minute, but you don't want to let that out in the air. Dust will accumulate on that. Dirt will accumulate. Be very careful of that sensor. But that's what makes the picture. The sensor gathers the light that you let into the camera and it creates the picture via the computer. So it's really, really important. So you're looking at a sensor view right now. This is what the picture will look like. If I take this picture and I hit this playhead button to show you what the picture looks like, that's the picture. That's exactly what we saw. If I grossly overexpose this, let me fix this auto ISO so we can so we can make this work. So if I do this and grossly overexpose things and I take the picture, that's exactly what we got. That and we look at it here, that's the picture. So very, very cool, very handy. So that's the view we're getting. That's not true with DSL cameras. What you see is not what you get. You don't know what you got until you actually look at the picture. So that's very cool. But there is a problem with that. It doesn't show you the true depth of field. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's, let's dial up a crazy big F number. So very small aperture of F22. F22 is crazy deep, right? That means that these one, two, three, four, five rows of animals, they should all be super sharp because this is a very depth of field. The focus plane, which runs perpendicular to the camera, is crazy deep. But if you look at the brown owl in the back there, it's blurry. So this thing lies to you. The LCD screen and the viewfinder lie. They show you the most shallow depth of field that your camera has to offer. Why that is, I don't know. But there is a DOF button on the front, a depth of field button. All we have to do is push that and watch the animal in the back. See how he's sharp now? Now it's telling us the truth. That's the true depth of field. There is a button we can set up so it always tells us the truth, and we will make that change. Why they leave it like this, I have no idea, but it's quite annoying sometimes. All right, let's get on to the other buttons now. So that is the DOF button. I don't think you'll be able to see that because it's really deep. I'll try to... Kind of slowly move this. I'll put a picture up if this doesn't come out. But that's the DOF button there. That's the one I just pushed to give us the true, the true depth of field. Again, the background is blurry. F22, it shouldn't be blurry. If you push that button in, you got the true depth of field. I don't know if that sucks up more power. I, I don't know why. If anybody knows why, let me know in the comments below. Uh, but we will. We will fix that so it always shows us the true depth of field. But that's our first button that we're going to modify. I'm going to assign that to, to eye detection on, eye detection off. But we'll do that in one section. Next, we have a shutter button up on the top here. Uh, this is a run-of-the-mill shutter button. Some people call it the release button. And if you half press it, it starts up the autofocus system and it locks on the autofocus system. We got Mr. Bill pretty good here. Full press the shutter button and it takes a picture. To review the picture, push the playhead button. 
and there's the review of it. Okay. Really not much more I have to say uh, about the shutter button. We're not going to modify it in any way. Let's skip the little MFN button there and let's go to the main dial here. All right, what does the main dial do? Of course, it controls the shutter speed we can see right there. Notice the icon. It's a little cog that's facing up. That's modifiable. Some of these other buttons will modify the function of that as we will see here in a minute. But main dial is very simply the shutter speed. What does the shutter speed do? Shutter speed allows a certain amount of light to hit the sensor because you can't allow too much light to hit the sensor or you'll overexpose your image. If you don't allow enough light to hit your sensor, then you underexpose it. So it really fine tunes uh, what the picture will look like with regard to the lightness and darkness of the picture. All right, now let's come back to the MFN button. I'm going to set that up to toggle between the autofocus points. But stock out of the box, if we push it, it has two rows of icons. And you can adjust the top row or the bottom row icon independently. And it does time out fast. If you want to go to the next one, you push the MFN button again. Push it again to advance. Push it again. And it goes on like that. I don't really like it like this, but let's look at how you adjust. So auto white balance, how would you adjust that? If you look, you can see the little half dome there, the little cog, that's our main dial. So the main dial must do something. Sure enough, it adjusts between the different white balance possibilities. These are for JPEG. We'll talk about these in a bit. That's Kelvin. I use Kelvin usually, but auto white balance is fine. Now, what about the bottom? How do we control the bottom? Well, there's a full dial right there, and that's actually the back thumb dial, people usually call it. The official name is the quick control dial number one. So if you hit quick control dial number one, then we toggle between those menu settings. See how that is? So always want it in a value to here. This is the metering modes right here. I'm not going to get into those. Always leave that in a value to If you want to go to the next set of icons just hit the MFN button again and we can adjust the these are the drive modes which is handy so I mean I like the idea but it's too complicated I mean we have all these settings in other places mostly in the quick menu anyway so I'm going to set this up to toggle between autofocus points directly and you'll see how I do that right that's the story with that we also have an emergency movie mode button which a lot of you don't understand when you hit this button it starts taking a movie. But where do the movie settings come from? Well, that's a mystery. Nobody seems to know how to control the exposure triangle here. Uh, it might be in an auto setup. We don't know. This is not the movie mode, though. This is an emergency movie type mode. You should not invoke it when you're in stills. You should go to the actual movie mode to invoke this. So let's turn it off. That will stop the movie. Where is the real movie mode? Well, the real movie mode has a dedicated switch over here. So if I go into that, you can see there's the shutter speed, there's the aperture, there's the ISO right there. We have full control over this. So in the emergency mode, we don't. So what do I do with that button? I turn it off. You don't know how many times that I thought it was in the movie mode, especially in the R7. You don't know how many times that I thought it was in movie mode and then I hit the start button and I wasn't. I was emergency starting and it used different settings and it screwed up my videos. So I always disable that thing, which I will do later. All right. We also have an on off switch right here. That's off. Obviously that is on. Comes on. Takes a little bit to come on. See, we're all out of focus now. It's lost that. So there's also another problem. If I'm in the off mode and I don't pull this hard enough, I'm in the stills mode now or the picture taking mode, but I'm really not. I'm locked and I don't realize that. I see a bird or something and I want to quickly adjust my exposure triangle and I try to move aperture and I'm turning it and I don't see that it's locked because you don't look at this when you're, I got my eye on the target. I'm like, why isn't the settings changed? Because I'm locked or you tried to change the ISO here. So the aperture and the ISO are both locked with this. I'm going to get rid of that. I hate that thing there. But maybe you have a use for it, but I don't. So you want to make sure you are all the way on. And now the aperture changes just fine and the ISO changes just fine. Which leads us to this dial. This is called the quick control dial number two. People call it the top thumb dial. 
You can call it what you want, but it does the same thing as the EOS R6 and EOS R5. It changes ISO. This is great. This is where I like my ISO. When I'm in my shooting position, I can still move it quite easily with my thumb. So very cool. I don't have to modify it like I did in all the other cameras. All right, I think that takes care of the top here. We should mention here that there is a diopter right here for the viewfinder. If you wear glasses, maybe you're sharing the camera with your wife, she doesn't wear glasses, and you look in here and everything's blurry, you can, you can use this diopter to kind of adjust your focus as you look through the viewfinder. I don't think I talked about that yet. But now on the back side of the camera, we have a rate button over here. So if I pull up the last picture I took by hitting the playhead button, uh, that's a movie, so let's scroll back like that. Let's get rid of that. How do I get rid of that? Just hit the garbage can. It's garbage. Get rid of it. All right. If I hit the rate button and I hit it again, I can rate how I like that picture. And when I put this in, in Lightroom, it'll show up there. I do all my processing in Lightroom, so I don't really use that. But that does have another function that's really important. We'll see here in a second. But that's what it does. The menu button takes us into the main menu. We're going to be hanging out in there in a little while. Uh, thank goodness we have a joystick. What does that do? If we pull up an autofocus box here, let's go to the quick menu. Let's grab a single autofocus point box so we can see what's going on. And let's get rid of some of this junk on the screen. Put this box up over here. Great. That's what this joystick does. The official name is the multi-controller, but it moves the autofocus box around, which you are going to be doing. It's also a cool function. If I want to snap it to the center, I just push it straight in and it snaps right to the center. How do I know it's in the center? Because it's got a little dot there saying I'm in the center. On the EOS R7, 8, and 10, you had to hit it a couple times. It was kind of a cheap little, or the EOS R8 didn't even have one, but on the, the EOS R10, EOS R7, you had to hit it a couple times. It was kind of a cheap, cheap joystick. But this is a really nice one. It works really good. All right, we have an AF on, a star button, and a rectangle button. Those are the famous back buttons. We'll save those. Magnification, so if you're out shooting and there's a bird way away, you're not sure what it is, you can hit that button and it magnifies. It's almost like you have a built-in binoculars there. You can hit it again to magnify even more, so it's very handy. If you have a picture up, hit it again to get out of it. Uh, if you have a picture up like this and you want to blow it up, you can hit it again only once. If you want to magnify it more, there is a downward-facing cog next to a magnifying glass. So that downward-facing cog is the top quick control dial. Again, people call it the top thumb dial. So if I modify that, I can blow it up or I can zoom it out. So that's what the magnifying glass does. Info button, that just puts different amount of information on the screen. The one with the histogram is very handy. If you have sun behind you and the screen is kind of blown out, you can't see that good. I always use that in situations like that to make sure I'm not blowing things out, letting, letting too much light in to hit the sensor. So that's handy. Once I have things set, then I hit the info button again and turn everything off. So it's up to you. What you see here is also what you would be seeing inside the viewfinder, exactly the same. All right, let's see what else we got. We know what the playhead button does already. That brings up the last picture. You want to see the second to the last picture, the third to the last picture. You go like that. If you want to delete that, you hit the trash can. I think we already talked about all this. So great. Uh, this is the quick control dial, the first quick control dial number one, or the back thumb dial, you can call it. What does it do? Again, it changes, well, it changes the pictures if, if we're in this playhead mode. If we get out of this mode, again, it changes the aperture or the F number right there. Um, let me bring a little bit more information on the screen so we can see. There we go. So you can see it moving the aperture there. There is a set button in the middle that we used a little bit. Uh, this does something kind of complicated. Let me get all the junk out of here again. If I hit the set button, it brings up a tracking box. The tracking box can't be manipulated like regular boxes can. It can be coaxed to go to the left or the right, uh, but the tracking box tracks and it depends what you have set up on the main menu. Uh, and we'll talk about that in depth. But the trouble with this tracking box, it's temporary. It doesn't 
turn it on in the menu. So you have to keep hitting it, right? Because if I go out, it times out, it disappears. It's it's kind of, I don't know, a work in progress. I never use it, but I wanted to mention that you can turn it on and off there. So now it's on, it's tracking for us. Now it's off. That's not the place to turn tracking on and off. I'll show you where that is here in a second. Okay, let's go over these back buttons now. So we have an AF on button. What does that do? That does exactly the same thing that half pressing the shutter does. If you half press the shutter, it locks on the autofocus system. It starts it up and it locks on the target. If you, ha if you full press and hold the AF on button, it does exactly the same thing, but it doesn't do anything more the way it's set up right now. So it really does nothing. It duplicates the work of the shutter button, but we can fix that and we are going to set that up and modify that to, to engage a small autofocus box with all tracking and recognition and eye detection turned off. Next, we have the AE lock button. If you push it and let it go, nothing happens. But if you push it, you can see the half cog is now next to the F number. And it also, there's the half cog says that the main dial has been reassigned. So now we can change aperture here. I don't know why we would want this, though, because we can change aperture right here more easily. Nevertheless, it's it's ripe to be set up, and we'll set it up to do something else in a little bit. We got a little explaining to do with this one. This is a powerful little button. Uh, this The name of this is the autofocus point select button. I just call it the rectangle button because it's a rectangle. But the name of it tells us what it does. If you push it, it pulls up all the autofocus points and gives you the ability to manipulate them. You can tap on one if you want. But, I mean, you don't want to do that. Your eye needs to be in the viewfinder. You have to do this while your eye's in the viewfinder. So you can toggle between the different autofocus points. How do you do that? It tells you right there. If you hit the MFN button, we can now toggle between these points. So watch this. Hit the MFN button. Goes to the next one. Then the next. Then zone one. Zone two. Zone three. Then whole area zone. And then back to the spot autofocus. So that's pretty cool. The only problem is we can't go right to left. We can't skip around unless you take your eye off the target, which you never want to do. So I'll show you how to fix that. We're going to move that over to the MFN button later. Anyway, that's what that does. Another powerful feature of this rectangle button, if you push it down, we see this info button does something else. What the heck is that? It's a little circle with three dashes. What does that mean? I call that the flashlight icon. Uh, because that engages subject tracking for real. Right now, it's on in the menu. If I hit the info button, before it times out, if I hit the info button, now it's off. Now it's on, now it's off. Wax on, wax off. So very powerful button that I bet a lot of you don't know. So with it off, the autofocus box behaves like a sight of a gun. It doesn't move. If you turn this thing on, however... Now it does have permission to go outside the box and look around for stuff. See how it goes outside of the box with Mr. Bill? I want to get Mr. Bill's chest here. See how the tracking box is on his eyes? So it's having some trouble. The reason it's not working great is because we're in people. It's the subject detection is for people. And this is the only kind of semi-person here that it sees. It doesn't see the owls. So that's how powerful that, that subject recognition is. It's incredibly powerful. But we'll get to that. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But anyway, that's what it does. So wax on, wax off. Subject tracking on, subject tracking off. And that will make permanent changes in the menu. Not permanent, but it'll make the real changes in the menu. Unlike this little tracking box thing, when you push set button, you get yourself that little tracking box. See, it's, it's tracking onto Mr. Bill there. I'm not even pushing anything. It's tracking. So we can get a good picture like that of Mr. Bill. But the trouble is it's temporary. All right. So very powerful, that little rectangle button. And I think that's about it. Matter of fact, I think that's pretty much it for this section of the video. I can't think of anything else we need to talk about here. We can take a look at the SD card slot. So I can open this up. There is a dual... UHS-2 SD card slot. I just have one in here right now. Um, and here is an SD card. 
And I always recommend using the SD cards that have the double row of pins right here. Okay, these are Lexors. These are the best ones that they have right now, 300 megabits read and write speed. And I'll explain that more when we get to the file size. Uh, but this will, this will help your buffer and it'll help transfer your files onto the computer. It's just a faster card. I mean, there's these old cards will work here. So that is a 150 megabit per second read and write speed. This is slow. It'll slow down. Your buffer will fill up much faster with these because the buffer can't unload onto these cards fast enough. So these just kind of sit around. And yeah, so, oops, that one's not going back in there. Here's another Lexor. These are much more affordable. These are 250 megabits per second. They're much cheaper and they really work just about as good as the more expensive 300 megabits per second. So I use these all the time. Uh, what else can we say about this? All right, we can pop out a battery here. So it takes it takes the old and the new style, the bigger batteries here. Okay, this one is a LPE6NH. So it's a little more powerful than this one. So this is a LPE6. And it's not as powerful, it doesn't last as long, but it takes any any kind. This kind of off-brand, by the way, I bought this. Uh, the Canons are much better. It's worth spending the extra money. The LP6NHs will last about 20% longer. So I would, I would recommend get the real Canon batteries for this because I have played around with the cheaper ones and they just don't work. All right, guys, that'll do it. Let's go to the next section. All right, guys, we made it to the menu section. Uh, we talked about this before when we did the semi-factory reset, but it has a row of icons on the top. Those are the main menu items. Each main menu item has a sub-menu underneath, which is made of numbers. Each sub-menu or each number has a sub-sub-menu, I guess that would be, of the actual menu items. All right, let's talk about big camera number one, image quality. Stock out of the box, it's a very large JPEG, 24 megabits, you can see right there. If you spent $2,500 on a camera, I seriously doubt you're going to be shooting in JPEG. JPEG images, the camera does the processing for you. If you shoot in RAW, then you do the processing in Lightroom or Photoshop or some other uh, photo editing program. I, I bet most of us do that. So you're going to want to turn JPEGs off. Now, do you shoot RAW or do you shoot C-RAW? The buffer isn't the greatest on this thing, guys. So you should shoot C-RAW. These files are half the size of RAW files, so your buffer will go a longer way. Probably a good time to do a demonstration to prove that. Let's shoot in RAW, and let's set this up so we shoot 40 frames per second. Can you believe that? This shoots 40 frames per second. But let's see how long you can actually shoot at 40 frames per second. I'll be right back, and I'll show you how to make these settings when we get there. Okay, guys, I just set it up for 40 frames per second. You ready? I'm going to say ready, set, go. When I say go, I'm going to smash the shutter button and hold it down. Let's see how long you can actually shoot 40 frames per second. Ready, set, go. <laughs> That's it. The red light's on. That means we filled up the buffer, and now the buffer has to write that information to the SD card. So you see what I mean? If you shoot in full raw, it's going to be a problem. So let's go back to number one. Now let's put it in C-RAW and do the same experiment. Now let's see. The, the buffer's all cleared now. Let, now let's see if we can shoot a little longer. Ready, set, go. A lot longer, right? At least double the length. So that's plenty. All right, so you can see you definitely want to be in C-RAW uh, if you're going to be shooting at 40 frames per second, right? So that's the story with that. The only time where you really shoot raw, and I see no difference, guys, between raw and C-RAW, and I print all kinds of huge things. I don't see any difference. The only time I see a difference is if you're before sunrise and it's dark. You're like shooting owls. And then if you're in raw, the raw file can recover a little more data compared to the C-RAW, but that's the only time or you're way after the sun goes down. That's the only time I ever switch it to RAW. All right, so so much for that. Um, let us let me be right back. Let me put it back because that's some of these menus are grayed out because I'm shooting 40 frames per second. So let me go fix that. 
All right, guys, I'm back. I got things back to stock settings again. So dual pixel raw, I don't mess with it. You have to use Canon's archaic software to get that to work, and it's just not worth messing with. Crop aspect ratio, nothing to worry about. Let's go to big camera two. Nothing to worry about here either. Big camera number three, nothing to worry about here. Leave this stock. Metering mode should always be in evaluative. It doesn't mean anything to us because we're not metering. We're in full manual, uh, but it does affect the way the viewfinder works, so it's good to leave it in evaluative. Number four, not that important, though. Let's go to auto white balance. All right, I like to shoot in Kelvin, right? It keeps the same white balance all the time. I like to shoot in 5,000, so I hit the little arrow and go down to 5,000 and then hit the back button and we're set at 5,000. If you want to shoot auto white balance, that's fine. Canon does a really good job with that if you're just going out taking pictures. If you're going out shooting movies, go to Calvin setting because it will change halfway through the movie. You'll come in a scene where it changes and it's really hard to fix that in post. So strongly recommend Calvin for that. All right, going down to color space, let's change that one. I like Adobe RGB, a little bit wider color gamut. You have a bit more different colors on your palette compared to the other one. Picture style, again, it doesn't affect, it only affects JPEGs, but this is where you can process some of your JPEGs uh, by playing around with these things. But I just like standard. I always shoot in standard. Uh, clarity, I don't mess with. Filters, I don't mess with. Number five, I don't think we have anything here to worry about. Number six, Burst mode is interesting. So burst mode, if you have this enabled the, and you're half pressing the shutter, let's say this, we're watching this brown owl here. And so we're half pressing the shutter. It's turned green so we know we're engaged. And we're waiting for the owl to fly. If you're in that burst mode, it's taking pictures right now even though we're not really taking pictures. It takes about three or four seconds worth of pictures and the trouble is, it's eating up the buffer. So if the bird actually flies, you're not going to have, even in C-Raw, you're not going to have much buffer left. And then when you're done, you can't shoot at all until everything is processed. And that takes like three times longer than normal. And then it doesn't create individual files with those buffered images. They're in a package, and you have to select the ones you want in the camera or with Canon software which is, again, archaic. So it's just too much of a hassle. All right, guys, so that's the story with burst mode. So next we have focus bracketing. We're just going to leave that disabled. I don't mess with that. And now we get to go to Big Camera 7. Made a big deal about memorizing Big Camera 7 because this is where the Mode Brothers live. And there's a shutter mode and drive mode. This is the only place that you can manipulate the shutter mode. And that's something you're going to definitely want to play with. And Canon should at least put this in the quick control menu. But they didn't. I can help you put it in the favorites menu, but you're going to have to memorize this thing. So here we go. Let's talk about the Mode Brothers. I think it's best to start the conversation by talking about the drive mode, because that's pretty straightforward. The drive mode controls the speed at which the camera takes shots Per press of the button. So there are three of them. There's a high speed continuous plus, there's a high speed continuous, and there's a low speed continuous. You want to be in one of these. Preferably the faster the better. You don't want to go so fast that you have trouble with the buffer though. Stock out of the box, you're set for single shot, and that's no good. That's just push and hold and you take one picture. doesn't matter how long you hold. That's no good for bird photography because you want to get that rare expression. Even if a bird is on a perch, he's going to do something. He's going to fluff up his feathers. He's going to yawn. He's going to wink at you. You want to get those moments. So you want to take a lot of pictures and just delete the ones you don't want. So bottom line is I recommend you always shoot in the fastest drive mode possible. That usually means high speed continuous plus. right? What are the actual speeds? So these speeds relate to the shutter modes because there's three different shutter modes and the shutter modes affect how fast you can actually shoot with this thing. 
in electronic shutter mode at high speed continuous plus, you can shoot an amazing 40 frames per second, right? That is just flying. But as we've demonstrated before, you are going to hit the buffer pretty quick, even if you're shooting in C-RAW. In electronic first curtain, which is my favorite mode, you're going to shoot 12 frames per second, and that's quite a disappointment. In the EOS R8, you could shoot 15 frames per second, and that's $1,000 cheaper, that camera. It's its little brother. I don't get why you can't shoot 15 frames per second in this camera, but it's disappointing. And that sounds like a lot, but when you're shooting eagles coming in and out of the nest, that's only three wing positions in that critical moment instead of six, seven, eight. So that's one thing I'm not happy with with regard to this camera. In mechanical, it's the same thing. It's 12 frames per second, and that's not great. If we go to the next one, second fastest speed in electronic, you can shoot an amazing 20 frames per second, and that's a mode I'm finding myself in more and more. With electronic first curtain, you drop down to 7, and with mechanical, you drop down to 5.5. In low speed continuous, you drop way down. In electronic shutter, that drops all the way down to seven. In mechanical and electronic first curtain, it drops down to five. So not super usable there. There are some other modes. There's a delayed mode where when you push the shutter button, it delays for 10 seconds so you can run and get out in front of the camera and take a selfie. There's a two second delay if you're shooting owls and you have a very slow shutter speed of a couple seconds. You might want to get, you might want to push this and just get your hands off it. Because even the push of the shutter button, even if you're on a tripod, can impart a little bit of vibration in here. So those are handy for owls and things like that. All right, that's the story with that. Now let's talk about the shutter mode. So we have electronic, electronic first curtain, and mechanical. The best way to explain these shutter modes is to use my glasses as a make-believe sensor. And remember we said the sensor, if I can get it just right, you see that's a real sensor on this RP right here. That's where all the magic happens. The sensor sees the light that you see only it makes a recording of that light. But the key is to make the picture, you can only expose the picture to a certain amount of light. How much light? Well, that's called up by the main dial here. We talked about how the main dial, and you can see it right here, the main dial controls your shutter speed. This is what dictates how much light will be exposed to your sensor. Okay, it's completely different from the shutter modes. So let's keep that in mind. We'll start with mechanical. That's been around forever, and it's starting to phase out. Like Nikon Z9 doesn't have it. The EOS R8 doesn't have it. So some of the cameras are phasing it out uh, because of a problem called shutter shock. All right, so if my glasses are the sensor, and this is the lens looking right at you, so light comes in, hits the sensor, the sensor makes the picture, but the sensor has to know how long of an exposure to this light is needed. And of course, that's controlled by the shutter speed. For our example, we're gonna use a shutter speed of two seconds. So that's almost in darkness. You're gonna be shooting an owl. But that will make it easier for me to explain. So I'm going to record two seconds worth of light to these glasses or to my sensor, and then I need to stop it. So in mechanical shutter mode, we start with a front curtain up here, or front shutter, or first curtain, and a second curtain farther back here. And they're both open. Why are they open? Because we're seeing a sensor view in our screen and in our viewfinder. Um, that's the way it is. But if we want to take a picture, we need to record two seconds worth of light for the proper exposure. So we're set up like this. When you push the shutter button, what happens is the front curtain comes down and blackens my glasses. So my glasses are black. The computer now starts the recording. So my se sensor here, my glasses start recording two seconds worth of light. So it comes down and it immediately goes up. Okay, so push the button. There's a little delay. Push the button, it comes down. The recording starts and it goes up. Trouble is it hits a stopping mechanism and shakes everything. But now we got light coming in, 1001, 1002. Okay, the exposure is over. 
Now the back curtain comes up rapidly and it hits another stopping mechanism, but it also cuts all the light off from the sensor. So it doesn't matter if there's a little shock here because there's nothing to really shock because everything is black. And as this one is up, another thing is happening behind the scenes. Let's remove the curtains to see. So we're actually recording our two seconds worth of light to the internal memory in this camera, and that memory is called the buffer. But the trouble is we just can't record the entire sensor at once. That would be great. We have to record it line by line by line. So the bottom line records and sends information to the buffer. Then the next line, then the next line, and next line, and next line, and next line, and next line, and, next line, and finally it's done. And this happens really, really fast. But there is a lag. There is a, a shutter right lag that occurs, and that can be trouble if the sensor isn't blackened. If the sensor is blackened, there's no trouble at all. So you won't get this thing called rolling shutter, which we'll look at here in a minute. Okay, but that's important to understand. So to review, we have you push the button, shutter comes down and bounces up and hits that stopping mechanism. There is a shake. And now light is hitting the sensor, 1001, 1002, the period is over. This back curtain then flies up and the sensor is black. It hits hard, but it, it shakes, but it doesn't matter because there's nothing to shake. There's no more light coming in. And behind the scenes, this thing is writing line by line by line by line by line. Okay, so that's mechanical, old school mechanical. The problem with mechanical, there's a lag. When you hit the button, it takes time for that first curtain to drop. And then there's that shutter shock when it goes up. Uh, at high speeds, it doesn't really matter, but at low speeds, like two seconds, that would be a huge problem. So a lot of photographers are getting away from that now. Now let's go to the opposite side of the spectrum and let's go in to electronic. And what is that? And it even warns you there, uh-oh, subjects may be distorted. What's that all about? So here's the story now. When you push the button, I mean, we're starting in the same position, right? The curtains are both open because we have a sensor view. We're looking, this is a sensor view of what's going on on the LCD screens here. So when you push the button to start, the computer just starts recording immediately. So my lenses or my sensor or my glasses are now recording 1001, 1002. Now here comes the problem. To stop the recording, the computer just turns off the sensor and says, okay, two seconds is over, start writing the data. And this is where the problem comes in because the sensor is still being exposed to the scene. So it starts recording line one, line two, line three. But what if there's a bird wing flapping in front of me and it's recording? So the bird wing may be down as it records here, but when I get halfway up to recording the data, to the buffer, now the bird's wing is here. And I'm still recording, recording, and recording. By the time I finally finish my last line, now the bird wing is up here. And so you get this blurred wing phenomenon going on there because the sensor wasn't blackened by a curtain. So that's called rolling shutter. And rolling shutter is a problem in some cameras. EOS R7, a huge problem. EOS R10, even a worse problem. The EOS R, even a worse problem. The slower the write speed, the slower that this takes place, read and write, read and write, read and write, the slower that takes place, the worse the potential is for rolling shutter. Now, if the bird is just sitting perfectly still, you won't have any rolling shutter. But if the bird is moving, you could have some major rolling shutter. All right. Now, good news about the USR 6 Mark II, it has the second fastest read and write speed of all the sensors, all the mirrorless sensors, except for the R3. The R3 is crazy fast. There's basically no rolling shutter with that camera. This one, there's a tiny bit of rolling shutter, but I don't even have a single picture to show you. And I shoot a lot of birds in flight, including swallows. I have nothing to show you here. Um, another problem that can occur is banding. Some colors, when they emit light, they pulsate like blues. And when you're having this slow write speed, the pulsation can occur and give you this weird streak across your image. So I don't have anything to show you with the 
the R6 Mark II either. I was having some trouble with the R10 and R7 with it. Um, so that's the problem with electronic. It's nice and quiet. You don't have to worry about noise. Now, if I was a sports photographer and filming super fast action like tennis serves or golf swings, there would be rolling shutter and that would be a problem. You would have to go to the EOS R3 for those sports. All right, we have one more shutter mode, which happens to be my shutter mode, and that is electronic first curtain. So what is electronic first curtain? Electronic first curtain is a hybrid mode. So let me, let's talk it through. So we start the same way and you hit the shutter button and the first curtain doesn't do anything, right? We had trouble with that first curtain. So the first curtain is electronic. That's where first, that's where electronic first curtain comes from. So when you push the shutter button, we instantly start recording. Okay, so my glasses or the sensor are now recording the image. 1001, 1002, picture's over. Now, rather than just turn off the picture, now we're going to blacken it by bringing up the second curtain. Very cool, right? So even though we have a little lag in our data writing time, doesn't matter because the sensor is blackened. So let's review that one again. So push the shutter button to start the picture. The, my glasses just turn on. The sensor turns on. Okay, I'm recording. 1001, 1002. Picture's over. To finish the picture, the back curtain or the second curtain or the second shutter, whatever you want to call it, flies up and blackens the sensor. Great. Is my sensor done recording? No, it's maybe halfway done, but it doesn't matter because the sensor is black now, so there's nothing to, there's no more picture to mutilate or band or anything like that. So it's really the best shutter mode that there is. Uh, and you can go see Ask David Bergman. Um, he, he agrees exactly with me on this topic, so feel free to check him out. I mean, he's been around forever, and that's his opinion on the matter as well. So I always shoot an electronic first curtain. There is a problem with that, though. So it's loud. Listen to, let's listen to it. Okay, that's 12 frames per second, which, by the way, is just too damn slow. Uh, but anyway, it's pretty loud, so if the birds are sensitive, you're going to have to go into electronic. All right, so that's pretty much the story with these shutter modes. All this talk, what's the bottom line? What's my recommendation? My recommendation is electronic first curtain, high speed, and we're, we're in there right now. And the drive mode will be high speed continuous plus. And that'll give us 12 frames per second. I sure wish it was at least 15. 20 would be better. But nevertheless, it is what it is. You will not have any trouble with shutter shock or shutter delay or rolling shutter or banding. All right. Now, for portrait photographers, there is a reported problem with electronic first curtain. And, but it's only with lenses that are super fast, like one2 uh, F numbers or 1.8 and at high speeds. And the problem is the bokeh looks a little bit distorted. It just looks a little funny, they say. And of course, bird photographers means absolutely nothing because there is no super telephoto lens that shoots at F 1.8 and certainly not F 1.2. So we don't have trouble with that. So for us, electronic first curtain is perfect. Now we have a little bit more work to do. We have a silent shutter function. If we go into that, it's going to make the shutter quiet. Now listen. You can see it flashing, but nothing's happening. You should know that puts you in electronic shutter mode, though. It takes you out of electronic first curtain, or it takes you out of mechanical. See, in fact, the shutter modes are now blocked out, and it just says electronic. Okay, so there's a better place to control that, so always leave that off. All right, um, another pet peeve here. I already turned it off. This is take two, but this is going to be on like this on your camera by default. You don't want to take pictures without an SD card in here, do you? Because they won't be saved to anything. You've lost them. So for goodness sakes, always turn this off. Great. Let's go to the next menu. 
Now we're on 8. Image stabilization mode, let's take a look at that. So this is your digital stabilization when you're in movie mode. So most of my lenses have stabilization built into them. And so you might not, and I shoot on a tripod, you might not want that on. If you're hand holding and walking around blogging or something like that, or walking around hand holding shooting video, then you want that thing on. So it's up to you what you do with that. Um, it depends. Usually I don't have mine on though because I am on a tripod when I shoot video. Okay, customize quick controls. So let's go into this thing. Let's see what this is all about. It takes a second to pull up. Here we have all the quick control menu options. And this is take two, so I've already gotten rid of them, but every single one of these is on by default. And we don't need all these things on. Right? When we modify this, we might as well modify this now like I had it. Just uncheck the ones you don't want. And so we definitely want this one on. Those are your autofocus points. Uh, we don't need servo. Autofocus areas, we need those on. Uh, metering mode, I don't need that on. I never mess with that. I shoot manual. Flicker, I mean, you can do what you want with these things, but I turn these things off. And we can go down even a little bit further. And there's some other ones you can turn on. Unfortunately, shutter mode is not in here. Canon, if you're listening to this, please put shutter mode in here so we can have that more accessible at the quick control menu. All right, click exit. And now let's go check out the quick control menu. Everything's gone except for two of them. All right, there's my autofocus point so I can control those. I've grayed out most of those except for a couple. And then there's your drive mode. They have drive mode. Why not shutter mode in here, Canon? Uh, but these are your different drive modes, so you can play around with these. All right, so that's what that one does. Uh, we can even go into that if you want to put a little space between those. Let's go back in there and make one more modification. See, there's an info rearrange here. Click on that. And now just grab one of them and drag it down. So we put a little more space in between there. Right? You can use the, you can also push the multi-controller or the joystick straight in, and grab it and drag it around like that. So whatever you want to do. And then go exit and click save. Now when we go back into the queue menu, there we got some space between those. Okay, so pretty cool. Let's go back to menu. Touch shutter, so this is disabled, it should be disabled, but if you ever accidentally turn this thing on, which you can do from the LCD screen, let's turn it on and see what happens. You can take a picture by just tapping. It's taking pictures. So it turns out what, what often happens, if we toggle the info button a couple times, there's an icon right there to control that. And you might be trying to control shutter speed and you accidentally hit that. See, I disabled it. Accidentally hit it. So you might turn it on there by mistake. So if it ever does that to you, you don't want that. That's probably what happened. And now it's disabled and it won't do anything like that. Okay. All right. Image review by default. When you take a picture, it's going to show up and block the screen for two or three seconds. You always want to turn that off. This is take two, so I already turned it off. Um, but there's the options. So it's usually set there by default. Let's show you what it looks like. Let's turn on a four second delay. Now if I take a picture, see how the screen is blocked? Okay, so we don't want that on. You just hit the playhead button if you want to see the picture, right? So let's turn that one off. All right, great. Okay, metering, we don't have to worry about that. We don't meter because I'm shooting in full manual. Number nine, display simulation. If we go in here, it's set to exposure. That's controlling what you see through the viewfinder and LCD screen. It Remember, it doesn't show you the true depth of field. I said I would show you how to fix that problem. There's the problem. Exposure plus depth of field. So click OK. And now it'll always show you the true depth of field when you look through the viewfinder or the LCD screen. And we talked about that already, so I won't re-explain that. 
Okay, nothing there. Nothing there. Display performance is important. So this is going to be set to power savings by default. Make sure you set this to smooth. Because when you're shooting birds in flight and looking through the viewfinder, if you don't have that on, the bird will have kind of a stuttered appearance because there's black frames that are interspersed between the original frames. So kind of like an old 1930s movie. So make sure you put smooth on there. Don't check suppress low frame rate. That's not ticked by default. Just like that is how you want it. And then you'll, things will look a lot better through this viewfinder. So now we'll go into number 10, big camera number 10. And now you're wondering, well, I thought it was in the camera mode or the stills modes. What's a movie setting? Remember I said that this, this record button is an emergency record button? If you hit that, it starts making a recording. But the settings you can't control, they're kind of automatic settings that we no one can figure out where to manipulate them. You can manipulate the file size of that emergency recording button here. So if you're not going to disable it, I disable this because I don't want to accidentally hit this in stills mode. It'll still work in movie mode, but it won't work in stills mode. But if you're going to leave this enabled, then you better make sure that you make this setting the same as the settings in the real movie mode. Okay, so usually that would be 4K60 for me, which is quite amazing. I don't talk much about video with this, but this shoots 4K 60 frames per second without any crop. It's absolutely amazing. No other camera on the market at this price point can touch that. So it's that's a real huge plus for this camera. Anyway, um, so that's the story with that. I'm gonna show I'm gonna again I'm gonna show you how to disable this so this doesn't won't impact you at all. Sound recording you can set to manual or auto. Yours will be on auto, but you can control the settings if you do show if you do shoot a lot of video. But again, this goes with the emergency record button. Right? Nothing we need to talk about here. All right, guys, that'll do it for the big camera menu here. Uh, let's move on to the next one. All right, what's next? That'll bring us to autofocus. Let's save this and talk about this in one section and just kind of finish this off. All right, so let's just jump to these. There's not much work to do on these, these other ones here. So this is the playhead button. There's really nothing we need to mess around with here. You can re-rate things here. You can play around with that. This None of this is important. There's only one that's actually important. I'll just go through them so you can at least see what they are. Right, this is the only really important setting here. So autofocus point display, I want that on. And again, because this is take two, yours is going to be disabled. You definitely want to turn that on. That means when you take a picture, take a picture of Gumby here, and you hit the playhead button to play it back. See the red box on there? So it shows you where your autofocus point hit. It's about 90% accurate. It's not always perfect. Uh, but that's very handy to have on. If you're not sure if you're hitting the target like a bird sitting in a nest, and you're not sure, are you getting the nest or are you getting the bird? That's very, very handy. All right, let's go to the next. Connectivity, I'll go through these, but there's nothing we need to do other than we do need to put on airplane mode. By default, this is set to off. You want to turn that on and that'll save battery life. It'll turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth so it's not running a battery trying to find those things constantly. Next, we go into the wrench. We don't have too much to do here. Format card. I always format cards before I go out shooting. Change time and date here. But we don't need to worry about that. You can just look at these settings. This is important to the the movie guide and the feature guide. So yours is going to be enabled by default. That's going to put extra text to try to explain things and you don't need that. It just clogs up the screen. So you can turn those off right here if you want. I have feature guide. I have that turned off as well right there. Okay, so that's wrench number two. Now the beeps are important. They're on by default. Let's look at volume. So this is a fake shutter volume. It is very, very cool. It's a little too loud though, right? I mean, we don't even need it that loud. 
So remember I said there's another place that you can silence this thing? Well, you can silence it right here. So if we go into the shutter volume, you can turn that down to this level. Let's, let's see what this sounds like. Or let's hear what this sounds like. My ears aren't the greatest, but I can hear that. So that's where I always set that thing. And you could turn it off if you don't want it there, dude. You can turn it off here. Now it's nothing. Right? But I'm going to set that back to to one great because I'm going out birding tomorrow I'm setting this camera up right now headphones power savings we turned everything off here I did that at the start of the video don't want any of that stuff on It'll, it may save 10 15 minutes of battery life but it's not worth it the bird of your life appears before you and you're in sleep mode it may take a second or two to wake up and the bird's gone so I don't recommend that turn it off Number four, you can change brightness here if it's a bright day. Uh, the viewfinder is really good, or the viewfinder usually is fine, but it's the screen that can be a little dim. So I usually bump this up to like six or even seven if, it's, if I'm going to stay out for a long time. And it makes the screen a lot brighter. So I need to fix my exposure now. Uh, but yeah, so that's really handy. I recommend doing that. It might drain the battery a little faster, though. Uh, but yeah, that's the story with that. Nothing else we need to do in here. Number five. Nothing. Number six. Nothing. We, we were here to reset the camera at the beginning. I do have the latest version of software in here, 1.1.2. Little cameras next, or the orange menu. Again, not a whole lot we need to do in here. Right here, though, I do like to set this one. Again, this is take two, so you guys are going to be disabled by default. So you want to go in here and set this to ISO and shutter speed. TV is shutter speed. And that means if you're out shooting with a variable aperture lens, like the 100 to 500, you're shooting at 500 and you quickly pan back to 300, that changes the aperture. Your aperture, your F number drops, which is awesome, but it will not change the other settings. So your exposure triangle will be off. If you have that set, it will automatically adjust the ISO and shutter speed if you drop the aperture. So that said, it doesn't seem to work all the time. It seems like I have to reshut the ISO and shutter speed the very first time, and then it works thereafter. So you can play around with that. Number three, we're going to be coming back to customize buttons like crazy a little bit later on in this, but right now we don't need to do anything here. Number four, nothing. Number five, nothing. Right, that brings us to the star menu. And so let's set some stuff up here. First of all, let's show you how, because this is take two, I got stuff set up. So let me show you how to get rid of it first. So go down here to configure. And then we want to delete selected items. Actually, we can delete all the items on the tab. Yep. Great. Now when we go back, there's nothing in the star menu. So let's add some stuff. So very handy to put to put the shutter mode here because the only place you can find it is Big Camera 7. So hit select items to register. And then let's go down and go find it. It's down here quite a ways. There's the drive mode. Let's put that one there. Very easy to do. Let's keep going down. There's the shutter mode. Great. That's all there is to it. So now if we go back, you can see drive mode and shutter mode. And let's check it out to make sure it works. Great. So we can control this here. 
All right, guys, that'll do it for this section. Let's get over and do the autofocus part of this video. All right, guys, here we are, autofocus system. Really, really important, as I said in the intro, to understand how subject detection works versus subject tracking versus eye autofocus. How do those intermix amongst themselves? Can we use one without the other? We'll answer all those questions. And then we'll go over these. These are the sights of a BB gun, sort of. Your job is to grab one of these and then put it on the target, uh, like there is the autofocus point, that box right there, your job is to put it on the target, the brown owl there, half press to engage it, and then full press to take the picture. That's the name of the game. All right, so let's get started. All right, guys, here we go. Let's start in autofocus menu. Let's go to submenu one, and let's go right down the list here. And I'm going to do one thing so it makes it a little easier for you to learn how this thing works. For right now, I'm going to turn off the subject tracking. So let's just select that and then turn it off. And these two always go together. Subject to detect. Let's just turn that off for right now. And with those two off, eye detection doesn't really work, so it doesn't matter. So let's just turn those two off as I explain this. So AF operation, let's go under here. By default, you're set to one shot. That is not good enough for bird photography. What that means is when you line up on a target, like the brown owl here, and I half press to lock on the target, that means that it will lock autofocus in that plane, and that's the end of the story. You can recompose. As long as you're half pressing the shutter, it keeps that autofocus plane. So you can recompose real nicely. I can go way over here. See how the bald eagle is still blurry? That's because it's locked on this autofocus plane. So it's nice to recompose. But the trouble is if that bird moves backwards or moves forwards, they'll be out of focus. To refocus, you have to release and then focus again. And if the bird flies away, there's no way you can gain focus on it. Okay, It'll just be out of focus. You can't keep regaining focus. So this would be fine for these stuffed animals that don't move, but we never ever use this. It's more for portrait photographers or landscape photographers for things that aren't moving. So let's set it to something else. I try to keep my hands away from the screen. So um, let's go into servo, see what that does. So servo means when you half press and hold, it's refocusing, refocusing, refocusing. If I go over to the bald eagle, I'm still half pressing. It's got the bald eagle. See how it focuses? So that's pretty cool. That's what you want because the bird's going to be moving even if it's sitting there. And if it flies, it's got you covered because it'll, it'll readjust as the bird flies away. And so the bird will always be in focus. So no brainer. Always, always, always want this to be in servo. What is this thing, this AI focus? I saw this in the R8. At first, I was excited. I thought, oh, there's a third focus mode with, with artificial intelligence now. This setting will try to make a decision whether you need to be in one shot or whether you need to be in servo. You always need to be in servo, so don't use this. Always keep it in servo. All right, next, let's go to the autofocus areas. So let's go into that menu, and you can see we have eight autofocus areas. I like to call them autofocus boxes, but Canon also calls them autofocus points. They used to call them autofocus methods. They're just boxes, guys, that the Canon's autofocus system will focus within. So let's go through them. Let's start with the littlest box, which is a spot autofocus. Got to hit OK here. And let's see what that one looks like. And there the little guy is right there. So the Canon's autofocus system, the powerful autofocus system, will look only inside the perimeter of that box. Now, what does it look for? That depends how you have it set up. Right now, I have everything turned off. So it's like an old school Canon EOS R6 or EOS R5. It looks for sharpness. It looks for detail. It looks for contrast. And if it sees that, it'll lock onto it. Right now, that black screen, there's nothing to lock onto. So it will struggle like crazy. But if I just touch that owl, that's got a lot of contrast and a lot of detail with the feathers. Oh, it's not feathers, it's fur. But it locks on no problem. And so that's a very handy one. You can go to different creatures and half press. I'm, I'm releasing and half pressing. But because I have it set up on servo, I really, I don't even have to 
release. I can just leave it on half press. See how it's got all of those? So that's what it does. The key point is without tracking on and without recognition on, it looks and it will stay inside the perimeter or the border of that box. Let's look at the next one. And where else can I pull these up? Remember the Q menu? We can go into here and there they are right up there, that little AF icon. And there's the whole list of them right there. Now this will time out. But let's go over to the next one. The next one is called one point or single point autofocus. And let's see what that one's about. What's the same thing, only it's bigger. It's a bigger box. So we got a little more to work with here. Again, if I try to focus over here, there's nothing to focus on. Okay, but if I go, it really struggles. But if I go over to the owl, no problem. And again, I can keep half pressing if I want and it'll focus or I can release. It doesn't matter what we do because we have servo on. Okay, Mr. Bill's a little out of focus there. We can zip right down there, grab him. See how cool that is, right? Do you remember how to get the focus box back in the center? Push the multi-controller or this joystick straight in. And did I miss this? I might have forgot to mention this in my earlier video, but this is the joystick or multi-controller. We can, it's like a joystick. You can move it around uh, and to get back to the center, you push it straight in. It's much better than the R7, the R8, the R10s, more it's a redesign for what I understand and it works really good. All right, let's check out the next one. Now we got, what do we got now? Well, it's the same single autofocus point box, but now we have some helper boxes around. So there's four of them. So how does this work? So if we try to lock on something without the box touching, it doesn't know where to go. But if I just take that little corner of the box and put it on the owl, that little box will save the day. So how does this work? So the autofocus system will look for sharpness, detail, contrast inside the big box first. 95% of the time, that's what's used to gain focus. But if it can't see anything, like in this case, it'll ask the perimeter boxes, hey, hey little guys, does anybody see sharpness, detail, or contrast? And Sure enough, that little box at three o'clock, it sees the fur of the owl and grabs it. And then we take the picture and the picture is really sharp, right? We can blow that up. Let's pull it up, hit the play head there. And that's pretty darn sharp. All right, let's see what else we got. Next one to the right, this is called expand autofocus area around. The last one was called expand autofocus area. They're just boxes with helpers around them is what I call them. Let's see what this one's all about. Oh, okay. It's another single autofocus point box, just like the second one we talked about, only it's got helper boxes all the way around. If you're going to use one, this is the one to use. So there's eight of those little helpers, and it's the same thing. If you put it out here with nothing to grab, it's actually finding a little contrast out there. No, it's not. But if we put it here, it struggles. All I gotta do is touch that owl a little bit with a couple of those boxes. Got it. See how those little helper boxes save the day? So that's the story with that one. What's next? Go to the quick menu. Okay, now we have three boxes that are the same. They're all flexible zones. These are magical guys. Why are they magical? In the first part of the video, I showed you how you can adjust the boundaries of these things, adjust the dimensions. It's amazing. I wish so bad that the R5 had this. So let's check out number one here and let's adjust it. I think we did this once before, but I set everything back to factory. And so, wow, we got a way bigger autofocus box. That's all it is, guys. It's just a bigger autofocus box. The way we have things set up right now, and again, it's gonna look for contrast and detail. Can't find it out here. Right? Red, red. It doesn't see any contrast, detail, or sharpness. But if I just touch that owl with the corners, we got it. It's better to put it like that. Uh, but now the boxes are getting so big, we're starting to have a problem. If I want to get Gumby down here, yeah, we got Gumby okay. But if I want to get the snowy owl there in the middle, I mean, it's still hanging in there. But you can see how easily 
like if I want to get Mr. Bill, see how it's not, it's having trouble, it's spilling over onto the eagle, and you can see that's not precise enough. Now you'll see when I turn on subject detection and tracking, it doesn't look for just sharpness and detail and contrast. It still does, but that's way down on the totem pole. When I put on detection and tracking, it engages that special chip that's on the motherboard that, that computer scientists have spent thousands of hours on developing, and it'll actually look for a bird. It'll look for the bird's face, the bird's head, then the bird's body, then contrast detail and sharpness. Those are the or the pecking order. It does not look for an eye yet with that technology. And we'll show you that here in a second. But right now, it's just like the R5. It's old school. It looks for sharpness and detail inside the box. Does anybody know how to modify it from part three of the video? Yeah, remember, it was the rectangle button. If you hit the rectangle button, then it's, it reminds you to hit the rate button to make these dimensional changes. So rectangle button, rate button. And now, this won't time out. Now we have two new icons. So there's the icon for the main dial. And there's the icon for this back thumb dial, or the official name was quick control dial number one. So yeah, we can turn those dials and see what happens. Oh cool, I can change the length of it. And then I hit this one right here. Cool, I can change the width of it. So now we have even a bigger focus box, right? So for birds in flight, you want a bigger box. And you can, while I'm in the field, depending on what type of bird I'm trying to shoot flying, I can adjust immediately, very quickly. I can adjust super quickly the size of this box to fit the situation. So very cool. But the bigger the box, the more trouble we run into. Because now it's looking for Gumby. Now it's looking for the snow owl. It doesn't, if I want it to find Gumby, I mean, it's still kind of hanging on. Remember, it will always start in the center of the box. And it will look in the center of the screen as well. I mean, it's kind of working. Like if I want to get the eagle, I mean, it's kind of working. But how would I really get the eagle, guys? I would have to quickly go to a smaller box. Just any one of these. Single point would work great. And now the way it's set up, tracking off, detection off, no problem. We got, and we can just go through the list here of animals, no problem. So very handy to have a, a single point, a small box that has no detection, no tracking turned on. Okay, great. What else do we have in here? Let's go back in this way. All right, so those are the three flexible zones that can all be modified. Last but not least, we have something called whole area autofocus. So what is that about? Let's see. Where's the box? The whole screen is now the box. Okay, so that's very cool for things that move really fast, like swallows. If you go out shooting swallows, those things move to the left and the right and into the plane of the page, out of the plane of the page. There, You can never tell where they're going, they're crazy, they're very hard to keep in the frame, especially with a big lens on. And so now, and you can see the box now, see the outline of it? Get some of the junk off here so you can see better. Yeah, there's the autofocus box, but now it's really hard to, if I want to get Gumby, I mean, it's still so smart, it can find Gumby. Can we get Pokey way down there? Eh, it's pretty hard to get Pokey. So we would need a smaller box. So you have to know how to switch between these boxes for the situation that you're in. All right, guys, that's it. That's the simple autofocus system with detection and tracking turned off. Now let's turn on the monsters here. Um, let's go back to the smallest autofocus point. Okay. And now let's see what happens when we turn on tracking. And they call it whole area tracking server autofocus it's just they're trying to tell you that it's going to track over the entire frame. It'll go outside the perimeter of these boxes. And that's the point. They didn't say that in the R8 and people were going, like I didn't know what was going on. It's like, what the heck? But it's actually a wonderful thing. But now they're trying to warn people, so they changed the name of that. And we got to turn on this powerful tracking. Now, by default, you're on people, and this won't do very good for bird photography. you got to go down to animals and turn that on. In fact, I'm going to show you how to gray out all that other stuff here in a second. Okay, um, eye auto detection should be on auto. Okay, there's a whole bunch of options. Just keep it on auto. And now let's see what happens to our 
little box. And you can immediately see, I'm not even touching it, there's a gray box around the owl. That's called a tracking frame. I call that a tracking box. And it's on the eye right now. I don't know if you can see that or not. So that's a hint saying, hey, Doug, I'm looking over the entire screen, and I know you want me to shoot this black nothing here, but I got something over here. So it's kind of telling me, uh, go over here. If I half press, sometimes it'll jump. If you're close enough, it'll start to jump. There we go. What happened to the little tiny spot autofocus box? We got the owl, right? There's a nice sharp picture of the owl. But the box is over here. So that's the beauty of this system. You don't have to be on the target even for this thing to work. And, I mean, for animals sitting around, it's, it's so easy. And if this was flying and you're, unfortunately, you had a tiny spot autofocus box and the thing takes off flying and you're like, Okay, I got it, but whoops, I'm, I missed it. Look how good it tracks that thing. I'm half pressing the shutter button. So you don't have to keep it inside the box anymore. If you tried to do this without detection and tracking on, it would immediately focus on the background and you'd have blurry shots. This is a lifesaver with birds in flight, guys. I kid you not. So you want to leave this thing on. I see a lot of YouTube videos showing to turn this off and just turn it on once in a while. Leave this on all the time because the autofocus system will still focus inside that box first. So if you're on the target, it's not going to wander off into the woods. Okay, it's, it's, If it agrees with your selection, it'll work just fine. The trouble comes when it starts to get crowded. So down here on, let's go with Gumby. So I try to get Gumby's belly button. That's not going to work. For one, Gumby's not a bird. Uh, for two, it's got that owl right next to it with way more contrast and detail. And the owl has an eye. And so I'm pushing, I'm trying to re-push and re-push, half press the shutter, but it just keeps grabbing the owl. So this is a situation where you quickly have to turn off detection and tracking. That's what we're gonna do with this AF on button. See how that works, guys? And if we go to another one, let's go to the Let's go to the expanded autofocus around. Let's go to the single autofocus point box that has helper boxes. How does that work? Well, the same thing, but now look immediately. It jumps right outside the perimeter of that box. It's saying, Doug, over here, I see something. See the, the gray tracking box is right on the eye. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's telling me go this way. And if I get close enough, it'll jump right onto the owl and override the box. See, none of the helper boxes are touching the owl, but it grabs the owl. It's got the owl's eye, and it can take a picture. So again, it kind of disobeys you, but it's in a good way. If I'm on the owl, and the owl takes off flying, and I'm trying to stay on the owl, and whoa, the owl's way outside the autofocus box. See how it's locked right down? I can get it way over here. I can get it. That was almost completely out of the screen. I can still get a really nice, sharp picture of that owl. We can blow that up like that. So very, very cool guys. Very powerful. What about if we go into the zones? Does the same thing apply? Same thing applies. It'll look inside the zone and then it'll say, see you later. We'll go outside that zone. See it's grabbing. It. There we go. We got the eye. See the eye? Lined up on the eye. Um, but yeah, but I mean, the bigger the box, the harder you're going to have getting smaller things like pokey. If I want to get pokey, there's no way I can get pokey. It's grabbed that snowy owl's eye. So we'd have to switch back to a spot focus. All right, guys. And then if I go to the last one, let's go into the Q menu. Let's go to whole area autofocus. Now you're just duplicating, but you are still looking for an eye, a face, a head, a body. And now it's just going to look over the entire screen. It'll still start in the middle of the screen, but it looks for the best eye it can find that's closest to the screen. Snowy Owl wins. If I put the brown owl in the center of the screen, it'll grab the brown owl. If I put the eagle, see how it still kind of looks in the center of the screen, even though there's nothing there. 
So that is the whole area tracking with detection and tracking on and eye detection on. All right, guys, really that's all there is to it. I just want to mention that this tracking box can be called up. Let's go back to a single autofocus point. I mentioned this before. So there is another way to track. If you push the set button, watch what happens to the autofocus box. See how it disappears and you get this tracking frame. And so the tracking frame will work. If I half press and hold and lock it on, the tracking frame will track as well. But it, see, it doesn't do as good of a job, so I never use it. I don't know if it's a different system. See, it's really struggling here. And then it disappears a lot. You have to keep repressing it to get the tracking frame back. I think it's for portrait photographers. Because if I put it on the eye of that owl there, see the little double arrows? I can push the joystick and it jumps between the two eyes, or it tries to. It doesn't do the best. I think it's still kind of... And, and then we lost it. i got to press it again. Yeah, so it's still kind of a work in progress if you want to jump between the left and the right eye. I mean, for bird photographers, it's ridiculous. But I wanted to mention it, because if you do actually hit the set button, it will disappear. Your autofocus box disappears. Hit it again, it comes back. So I recommend staying away from that. All right, guys, so that was the autofocus areas, and we also introduced tracking and detection as well. But just to recap, so detection, also called recognition, it's subject to detect. That's subject detection. That's got the special AI chip that you engage when this is on, and you can choose between people versus animals, vehicles, or auto, let it select it. Guys, for birding, just always keep it on animals. Animals are cats, dogs, birds, horses, and zebras. And again, there's a chip on the motherboard of this thing that's been designed. Thousands and thousands of hours of work have went into that to detect these creatures. And so you have to use it. You just absolutely have to use it almost all the time. So I won't say anything more about that. We'll just leave it on. So eye detection, we talked about that quickly. Leave it on auto. That'll find the closest eye that it sees. We're going to turn that on and off. This isn't super important the way I'm setting this up. I'm going to actually disable the right and left eye here in a minute. But, but the bottom line is to leave it in auto. Now we come to switched tracked subjects. So we need to talk about stickiness of the autofocus box. So let's go into the menu, and we have three degrees of stickiness. Number one is like a neutral. Zero means it'll be sticky on the initial target. And number two means it can switch targets really easily. And for birds in flight, you always want to go this way. I always set this on zero. I call this one degree of stickiness. And so now, let's go back in here and, and kind of try to demonstrate this. So there's an autofocus box, and I got this brown owl, and the brown owl takes off, and it goes behind some bushes, it goes behind these other animals. Do you want to stay locked on the owl when you're shooting? Or do you want to grab on one of these other animals or grab the bush or grab the tree? Of course you want to stay on the target. So it, one degree of stickiness works really well. If I didn't want to, if, I, if these were sitting around here, I wanted to easily be able to jump from animal to animal to animal, then maybe you don't want it quite so sticky. But for me, you can still, I mean, look how easily I'm jumping from animal to animal. Okay, and I'm just half pressing, half pressing, the eagle's out of focus, half pressing. And with servo on, I don't even need to keep re-half pressing. I just half press and hold. I just point, put it in the middle, and it grabs. A little trouble there. There we go. I had a half press, re-half press on that. Okay, but it's sticky. So I always, bottom line, always set it to one degree of stickiness there. All right, great. Let's go to number two, the submenu number two. So a lot of videos on this. It's really simple, guys. It's not as complicated as people make it out to be. So we have five different cases. Case one, two, three, four, and an auto. 
I'm going to talk a lot and explain this, but the bottom line is always keep it on auto. 95% of the time I'm on auto and I get amazing shots. In fact, here's a series I got yesterday of a fledgling bald eagle making her first kill, getting lunch for herself. And I was in a hurry. I was just getting ready to leave and I didn't even have time to really set up. I just grabbed the camera and started shooting. And you can see I was in auto and you can see how great it did. Every single shot is sharp. And this is with the eagle flying in front of the worst background in the world, a eucalyptus tree. The R5 would have got one shot out of about 20. I'd be lucky if I got one out of 20. Every single one was sharp with his camera and I was on auto. So that's the bottom line. But let's explain these though. So if we go back to number two, let's look at case one. And each case is built with two settings, a tracking sensitivity and an acceleration deacceleration. Tracking sensitivity is just another stickiness setting. Remember right now we said we have one degree of stickiness, extra stickiness turned on. Do you want some more stickiness? You can do that. You can go to tracking sensitivity and you can give it another degree of stickiness. You can make it crazy sticky. There's two more degrees of stickiness. So see how I've modified that? But stock out of the box, this one is set to zero and acceleration, deacceleration is set to zero. This one doesn't exist. It's a nothing right? There's no modifications made, so you don't even have to use it, okay? If we go to number two, so this one is set up to have one more degree of stickiness, right? So this one is useful. A lot of bird photographers like this one for birds in flight because you have two degrees of stickiness. I mean, this would have worked great for the eagle coming from an area with an easy background, like a blue sky. It's easy to lock on. The R5 can lock on there, and then you want to stay sticky on that bird as it flies in front of that horrible eucalyptus tree background. This will work just fine. The trouble is when the bird takes off and it's sitting on the nest and the autofocus can have a little trouble grabbing a stick, it might stay stuck to the stick instead of the eagle. I've had that happen a million times. And so I still like the auto. Number three, so this is an interesting one. So it actually negates the one degree of stickiness we already created in menu one. And so it's got a positive sign here. So we're back to a neutral degree of stickiness. But this is if you want to change subjects. You don't want it quite so sticky on a subject, which I never ever do. I want it sticky on my subjects. If I want to get on a new subject, I just release the shutter button and half press again. So for me, it I mean, it doesn't make any sense for me. Now we have a new setting to talk about. Acceleration, deacceleration. What is that? Because we got one degree of that, whatever it is. So that will warn the camera that the subject you're going to be shooting is going to have erratic, crazy, insane movement. Like a swallow is a perfect example. There's not a better example on earth than a swallow. Uh, sports, like a, like a halfback running, open field, dodging tackles, cutting. Swallow is way more erratic movement. So uh, that's where this is tested the best. And when I do shoot swallows, I do use it. That's the only time I'll go in here. But I want it sticky, so I modify it. So I'll go in to the acceleration, deacceleration. I'll leave that. But I'll go into tracking sensitivity, and I'll give myself one more degree of stickiness. So now I got two degrees of stickiness, one for menu one and another degree here. So I have two degrees of stickiness and now I have a one warning that we're shooting swallows. The movement's going to be crazy and that seems to work the best for swallows. All right guys, after all that talk, bottom line is to go into auto and let the camera decide. Some people say, oh, it takes too long. It doesn't take too long. It works great. Again, that series of eagle shots, I was in auto for that. It works just fine. All right, so that's my recommendation there. Keep it in auto. So not a whole lot we need to talk about here. There is a little laser beam that comes out in darkness. We we'll always disable that. It doesn't do any good anyway. It might disturb the bird. So auto focus assist beam firing, turn that off. Um, lens drive when autofocus is impossible. This with this on, the lens will try to refocus, refocus, refocus. It's doing that anyway from servo. So... Um, but that's just on by default. Preview autofocus, just leave that disabled. Nothing else we need to do here. Autofocus menu number four. So 
this is a limiting menu. We can limit all kinds of stuff here. And let's do that. Let's go into limit autofocus areas. Touch and drag, just leave that off. But let's go limit stuff. So there's all our autofocus points. Guys, we don't need all these things on. So let's turn the single autofocus point off. Let's turn that one off. If I'm going to have helper boxes, we want them all the way around. I'm going to leave that. I only need one zone. I don't need three. Right, so we can turn these guys off. And I always keep this one. If there's swallows around, you've got to go in whole area for that. Uh, and there's a spot. We're going to set up a dedicated spot, so sometimes I turn this off. I mean, a lot of times, guys, I shoot like this. I'll shoot with these three, or I'll even turn this one off because I have a spot autofocus set up on the back. So a lot of times I'll just be able to quickly switch between these two things, even in mid-flight. Sometimes I'll grab the eagle on a tighter, flexible zone coming off the nest, and once it gets into the open sky, with one click of the MFN button, I can switch over to the, the whole area to track it a little bit better. So... Uh, but for this video, I'll leave a couple of these on because maybe we're going to modify these later. But that's how you do it. I'll, I'll, let's see what it looks like. So let's go into the quick menu and see. And you can see how we have them grayed out now. All right. So limiting menu number four. Let's limit some more stuff. We're coming back to this autofocus area selection. We're going to come back to that one when we do modifications. But here's another limiter. So limit subject to detect. Let's see what that one is. Oh, okay. If you want to make sure you don't make any mistakes, I don't. I never want auto on. I don't want people if I'm out shooting birds. And I don't want cars ever on because I don't shoot cars. I want on and off. Okay. And that's it. Now if we go back to menu number one and see what that did. Let's go up to subject to detect, and you can see they're grayed out, except for animals in none. Great. Let's go back to number four, the limiting menu. And we can do the same thing with eyes. I don't ever want to shoot the right versus the left eye. I don't want it trying to struggle to figure that out. I just want it to find, if it sees an eye, grab the eye that's closest. And I want to be able to turn it off as well. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to menu one and see what that looks like. Go to I, and you can see they're grayed out. So disabled and auto are on. So that's the way I do it, no pun intended. All right, great. So we got the limiting stuff talked about. I'm not going to worry about orientation. That's for flipping between when you go vertical versus straight. I'm not, I just leave that set. Okay, number five. So this is important because Sometimes the autofocus doesn't work. If there's an eagle and it's way nestled back and I have a little hole through the branches to see it, autofocus won't work. So I have to go to manual and all the manual settings are off. So let's turn these on. Manual focus peak setting, turn it on. Great. I like red. I, I like the level high. So those are default. And for goodness sakes, turn on the focus guide. These are like little sticks. We'll see in a second. I'll do a demonstration. Okay, great. So now let's say I want to shoot Mr. Bill. And for whatever reason, well, we know the reason. I have my autofocus box is too big, but I just can't get, get Mr. Bill. So I want to go to manual. What you got to do is go to this, your lens. And almost all lenses have an autofocus versus manual switch. Just flick it to manual. If they, if it's an old school lens and it doesn't have that, then there's a spot in the camera where you can adjust that. But now look what I have. So I have a little box still, and I have two little sticks, and that shows that Mr. Bill is not in focus. And I also have redness. Like, look at the eagle. See the eagle's eye is now red? That's where the autofocus plane is. So... I want to bring that redness and I want those sticks together on Mr. Bill. And I have this set up really fine. You can you can adjust how fine you want it. Uh, but now, I guess the eagle's eye is still kind of red, so I must be in a higher F number. Uh, but you can see that the sticks are in line in green, so Mr. Bill is going to be sharp if I take a picture 
and we blow that up and take a look at that. And yeah, Mr. Bill is pretty sharp. All right, guys, so that's the story with that. Uh, very handy for that situation. But let's switch it back to autofocus. All right, great. Let's go back into the menu, see what else we have here. Um, if your lens does not have manual focus to autofocus switch like that, another menu option will pop up here, or I think it's actually here, another menu will pop up, and it'll give you the ability to go be, turn off the autofocus on the camera so you can use the lens as manual focus. So, all right, what's up next? Number six, I don't think there's anything we need to talk about here. All right, guys, that'll do it. We got through the autofocus menu. Again, you know, watch this again and again until the sinks in. This is probably the most important part of this video. But now in the next section, I'm going to show you how to do my button modification. So that should be exciting. All right, guys, in this section of the video, I'm going to show you my button modifications for bird photography. I have a feeling a lot of you came over here from the table of contents. So really quickly, I'm going to go through the autofocus menu. I'm going to fly through it just so we're all on the same page. If I go too fast, then go back to the other parts of this video and watch what you need. All right, guys, here we go. Super quick. Let's go into the menu. And I did a factory reset again on this. So let's go into the autofocus. Uh, AF operation, you want that on servo. Autofocus area, it depends on what you're shooting. We toggle between these all the time, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. These change all the time. Whole area tracking servo autofocus. I just call this subject tracking. This is on. And subject to detect, that's a problem. That needs to be on animals, not people. Animals are birds, cats, dogs, horses, zebras. Okay, I detect as auto, that's fine. Switch track subjects. I said make the autofocus point a little stickier, set that to zero. Cases, auto is fine. We can turn off this AF assist beam. It doesn't do anything anyway. It might disturb the birds in low light. Now this is the limiting menu I went through here and limited a lot of stuff. I'm not going to worry about that right now. So autofocus menu 5, we need to turn that on because there are times when you want to manually focus and not autofocus. So for my setup guide, it's not going to make any difference, but let's just turn this on. Peaking, turn it on. Everything else is fine there. Focus guides, definitely want those on. Those are those little sticks that will come together when you're in focus. Great. Let's go to number 6. And there's nothing in here we need to turn on. All right, a couple more tweaks here. Let's go to the big camera. For image quality, of course, we want to go to C-RAW. And I explained that fully before. There's nothing else we need to worry about. Big camera 7. This depends on what you're shooting, but I recommend High Speed Continuous Plus. If you don't have to worry about noise, Shutter mode, if I can hit it, electronic first curtain, great. Shooting at 12 frames per second, it's a little loud. If that's too loud for you or you want something a little quicker, then you can go into high speed continuous and go into shutter mode electronic. And this, I'm finding myself in this mode more and more. This is 20 frames per second. I have a fake shutter sound, it's set up by default. So 20 frames per second is flying. That's a really good mode and you don't have any trouble with the buffer. Number eight, image review. Let's turn that off. We don't want things blocking our screen. Duration to off. That'll pop the last image up in the screen. So we turn that off. Number nine, display performance, smooth. That'll help the viewfinder for birds in flight. Display simulation. We want that exposure DOF so the viewfinder and screen always show you the true depth of field. Okay, these control the emergency movie on button. I'm not going to worry about those. All right, guys, now we're all on the same page. Again, I flew through those settings, so go back through the video if you need more explanation. 
Now let me show you my button modifications. Very first one that I'm going to do is the depth of field button because we already have depth of field set up in the menu. You can probably see it right down there. As we said before, it has no manual versus autofocus switch on it, which is a little disappointing. The R8 had that, so did the R7. Nevertheless, we're going to set that up to turn on and off eye detection. So to make these button modifications, we're going to be going down the very similar path. So let's go into the menu. Let's go into little camera. Let's go to number three and let's go down to customize buttons. We're going to be doing this again and again. That brings up a little cartoon of the camera and you can see that a little button is glowing orange there. In fact, that's this one right here. That's the shutter button. Whatever button glows orange is the one you're about to change. We want the DOF button, which is on the front down at the bottom. So just use the main dial or you can use the top quick control dial here. I guess the official name is quick control dial number two. You can even use the quick control dial number one here on the back. Whichever one you want. Let's scroll between these until we have the orange dot on the target. And there we go. Notice we have the stills or a camera. These are the settings for stills mode on the left and we have another column on the right for video or movie mode. So I'm not going to go into setting up this up for video, but this is where you make these changes here. All right, so let's go into the menu by hitting the set button or you can tap on the screen. The default setting for whatever menu you go into is always all the way to the top and to the left. So depth of field preview button. We want to turn on eye autofocus. So let's go look for some eyeballs. There's one eyeball and there's another. So what's the story with this? This is eye detection autofocus. So if you push the DOF button and hold it down, not only will it turn on eye detect, but it'll turn on tracking as well. And I don't recommend you use that. It doesn't seem to work as good as the subject tracking button in the menu does. So don't use that one. I can demonstrate it real quick. Let's set it up real quick. So hit the set button. Now if I push the DOF button down, now I'm using this part of my finger here and I'm just pushing down. It takes a little getting used to, but in the power position when you're really squeezing this camera, it's really easy to, to hit that button once you get a little muscle memory going. So if I hit that, See how the focus box is locked on the snowy owl's eye. Okay. Once you go... All right, now it's back here on the brow now. So that's pretty cool, but I don't want to be holding down buttons when I'm shooting. I want to hold down one button, and that's going to be the shutter button most of the time. So I don't recommend setting it up like that. Let's change it. Let's go back into custom buttons. Let's go find it again. DOF button, where is it? There it is. Let's go back in there. Let's use this second eyeball here. And this is called eye detection. That's all we want. So if I click OK, now all I have to do is press the DOF button. And now we can see we're toggling through the different eye auto detection options. When I flew through the autofocus settings, I forgot to turn all this other junk off. So let's go back and do that. I don't I just want the eye to come on or I want it to come off. So let's go fix that. Let's go into menu, autofocus. Number four is the limiting menu. And down here under eye detection, we're gonna limit some stuff. So I want to be able to turn this off and I want it to come on. It'll grab whatever eye it finds first, but I don't want it looking for a right versus a left. I think that's gonna take up too much time and we don't need that. Now when I go hit the DOF button, it turns on, turns off, turns on, turns off. And we can see it if it's if it's on and I half press the shutter, you can see a blue box around the little owl there. Okay, if I turn it off and I half press the shutter, we don't have eye autofocus on, but we are looking for the face of a bird then. And it's finding the face. Let's try the bald eagle. It's got the face. If I turn eye detection on by pushing the DOF button, now can you see the little blue box right around the eagle's eye? Great. The eagle is nice and sharp. 
So that's all there is to that one. Let's move to the top of the camera. All right, now you guys don't have to do this if you want. There is an emergency movie record button where you push this, you're in stills mode, and you push this and it starts recording. It uses automatic settings and I don't like that. So I want to turn that off. I don't know how many times I thought I was in this mode, the movie taking mode, but I wasn't. I was in stills mode and I accidentally started this and I didn't have the right settings and I couldn't figure out what I did wrong. So bottom line, I'm going to turn that off. It's really simple. And if I turn it off here, it will not be turned off in the movie mode. Let's go find it. Little camera, customize buttons. I think it's the first click. There it is. So let's just get rid of that. If I scroll all the way down, scroll over, there's off. Click OK. And now when I hit this button, nothing happens. If I go into movie mode, and now I hit the button, it will start just to show you it didn't affect that. All right. What else do I do here? The main dial will control my shutter speed as always. Quick control dial number one will control my ISO as always. I don't need to modify those. But I don't like this thing. So this is what happens to me a lot. So I'm out walking, I see a bird, I get excited, I pull this and think I've turned it on. And I have turned it on, but I'm in lock. And I go to adjust my aperture See the lock button? Nothing happens. And my eyes in the viewfinder, that does not show lock in the viewfinder. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? I try to adjust my ISO lock. Very, very annoying. Let's get rid of that function right now. All right, guys, let's go find it. Let's go into the menu. It's in the wrench. Number five, multifunction lock. So you can even make it do more things if you want, but I don't want it locking anything. So let's just uncheck all of these so it doesn't work anymore. Great, click OK. Great, and now when I'm in lock, like I am now, if I change my aperture, my aperture is gonna change. And by the way, this is how you change your aperture, this quick control dial number one here, just like the R5 and R6. And my ISO works just fine as well. Great, no more lock button. All right, guys, this is an important one. This little button right here, the MFN button, stock out of the box, as I told you, if you push it, it pulls up this double row of menus, and it's not very handy. So I always set the MFN button to toggle between the different autofocus points. So let me show you how to set that up. I'll show you how to set this up two ways. So let's go into menu, same story, little camera, Customize buttons. Let's go find it. Just a couple turns of the main dial have found it. And let's go in. So that's multifunction settings. So there's a beautiful little button right here. They left out of the R10, which was really annoying for me. It's called direct autofocus area selection. Let's say, yeah, let's set that. And now when I hit the MFN button and I hit it again and again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. You can see we're toggling from left to right between all the autofocus areas. You remember, these are the autofocus areas, right? So that's really handy if I want to toggle the next one, next one, next one. Now, the next problem is if you're out in the field, there's way too many of these. Usually I have two of them set up so I can super quickly toggle. While the bird is taking off, I can toggle while the bird is even just starting to take off. So let me show you how to get rid of some of these. Let's go to menu. Let's go to autofocus. Let's go to number four is the limiting menu. And there's limit autofocus areas. And let's go into that. And let's just uncheck some of these. We're not going to need a spot autofocus because I'm going to set that up on the AF on button. I don't need a single autofocus point. I don't need a single autofocus point with helpers around it. Now I do like this one. It's a single autofocus point with lots of helpers around. We explained these in depth. That one's useful. And one flexible zone is useful. I don't need three flexible zones. But I do need the whole area autofocus. This is where the entire screen is the autofocus box. So that one's very handy. Click OK. 
And now watch what happens when I toggle by hitting the MFN button now. Now we just toggle between these three. There's a round, there's a flexible zone, and now the entire box is the autofocus zone. All right, here's another way. Maybe if you're new and you don't have these autofocus points memorized that well and you want to physically see them, we can do a different type of setup. In fact, we can take this rectangle button. Remember the rectangle button? If you push that, it immediately pops up the autofocus points. And then it says the FN button will toggle between them. All right, let's just move that over on the MFN button. It's really as simple as that. There's no law that says you can't have two of these. Little camera, customize buttons. There's the MFN button. And right there is the rectangle button. Great, let's set that up there. Now when I push the MFN button once, you can see exactly where you are. Push it again and it toggles to the right. Push it again, it toggles to the right. It's toggling between these three because we limited those other ones because we don't need all those things. But you can do whatever you want, right? It still works over here. So you can modify that to do something else. All right, great. Well, I'm going out birding later today, so I'm going to change that back if you don't mind. Let's change it back to the other way I had it. There it is, and let's put this one right there on it. That's the direct autofocus area selection. Hit OK. Make sure you hit OK or it won't work. And now I can quickly toggle between these three. All right, great. So that does it for the top of the camera. Let's start working on the back now. Not a whole bunch we need to do here, but we do have the three back buttons we're going to be working with a lot. Uh, I don't like this thing, the set button. Remember this pulls up a tracking frame and you can half press and it'll lock on. It's not as powerful as the subject detection, subject recognition in the main menu. So let's turn that one off. It won't affect the set button in any other way. So let's go find that one. And that's up to you again. It just annoys me. So I'm going to turn it off because I'm going birding later and I don't want to be annoyed by this thing. Okay, so there we are. Stop, start, whole area, autofocus tracking. That brings up that weird tracking box. That's the one where you can switch between the right eye and the left eye by pulling the multi-controller left or right. There it is, all the way down there, off. Click OK, great. And now when I push it, nothing happens. Just to show you we didn't affect anything else, I can still hit the set button and it still functions. Okay guys, that'll take care of everything, but let's talk now about how to set this up for triple button autofocus. Now that we have the autofocus menu set, we're basically in the main autofocus method right now. And that is by half pressing the shutter button that will start the autofocus. And what does that mean? That means it's gonna turn on subject detection and subject tracking by half pressing the shutter button. Okay, I'm gonna leave the shutter button set to start the autofocus up. It'll also pull up whatever tracking box you have. So here I have that single autofocus point around with those helper boxes, um, and you can see it there. Now remember, as I explained, because subject detection and tracking are on, it has permission to look outside of the perimeters of this box. So when I half press the shutter, it will look in this box, but it will look elsewhere. It always starts in the box and then it'll take off and try to find something else. And you can see it's grabbed the owl there. And the closer I move it to that owl, now it's got the eye. And remember the hierarchy with eye detection on, it'll look for an eye. Next, if it can't find the eye, it looks for a face of a bird. Next, it'll look for the head of a bird. Next, a body of a bird. And last but not least, it'll divert back to contrast in detail. Okay, contrast in detail is the, it's, and that's a fine setting as well. There's nothing wrong with that. But that turns off the subject detection, and subject tracking. That's not used in that mode. Okay, great. So, I mean, we have it. This is how most of the day right here. If that box isn't working, I want a zone, then I just hit the MFN button and now I'm in a zone. 
if I all of a sudden swallows pop up, which are really hard to shoot, I need the whole frame to be my autofocus box. I hit the MFM button again, and now I'm, I'll track that swallow. I'll try to keep it inside the borders of the screen, and sometimes it's still hard to do. So, okay, now I'm back to animals. I don't need that. I just go back to this autofocus box. All right, and you can set those up. You remember how to adjust the screen? That's kind of a small screen. It's too similar to the single autofocus point box around. Let's make that bigger. You remember how to do that? Great. Some of you do remember. Hit the rectangle button, and then it says right there, hit the rate button over here. And now we have modified the main dial and the back quick control dial, number one here, to modify the size of that. So the main dial controls the length and the back quick control dial one controls the height. That's more usable for me right there, maybe a little bit longer. This is exactly how I want this setup to go birding later this afternoon. Okay, cool. All right, so there will be a time when we can't use this. If I want to get Gumby down here, let's say there's Gumby. I need a picture of Gumby. There's no way that we can focus on Gumby. First of all, it's not really an animal, so it's grabbing the snowy owl. Well, let's change autofocus box. Let's go to the single point around. Can I get Gumby? No. So there will be situations. Well, that's kind of trying to get Gumby, but no. So there'll be situations like this when it doesn't work. I quickly need to turn off subject detection and subject recognition because that's what's screwing this up. With those on, see it's got the owl's eye there. With those on, the autofocus has permission to go outside the borders of the box. I don't want that. So let's set the AF on button to immediately turn off subject tracking and subject detection. How do we do that? Well, let's go to the menu, that same path, customize buttons. Let's go find the AF on button. There it is, not there, that's movie mode, that won't work. Right there, let's go in, and here we are. Now there's a couple ways to do this, because remember this button, this, this AFN button also starts up the autofocus. You can see it starts it up. I'm not touching the shutter button. Okay, so there's no reason that we can't have both of these buttons calling up or starting the autofocus. There's no reason. It doesn't seem to be any problem with that, although I have heard reports that some people have found a little bit of trouble with that. So let me show you two ways to set this up. The easiest way is just to go in here to the AF on button. It's already set up to start the autofocus, autofocus start, but we have additional settings here under detail set info. So you can hit the info button and look at all these settings. Guys, really important to understand, these are overriding settings. If you have these settings checked, they will override the main menu settings. And that's exactly what we want because I have subject detection, subject tracking turned on in the main menu. So we need to turn those off. Okay, so there's subject detection and you have to check it and you have to set it. Go in and set it we want off. Okay, now it's not going to detect anything. This won't work though because we have tracking on. This will still go outside the perimeters of that box. Oh, you don't believe me? Watch. Okay, let's pull up the autofocus point here. Let's put it right on Gumby. And you can see it immediately jumps on the snowy owl. So you have to set subject detection, subject tracking. Both have to be turned off for this to work. I get emails. Why isn't this working? This is because you forgot to turn them both off. Let's go into info and let's get rid of tracking now. Eye detection doesn't matter. You can leave that on because that doesn't work without these two on. These two work together. Off. Okay, now double check. Check, check it and set it. So we got check. Subject detection is off. Check. Whole, tra whole area tracking. That's a subject tracking. Off. Great, now it will work just fine. Okay, okay, we can't get Gumby. If I push and hold the F on button now, we can get Gumby. I can get Mr. Bill. I can get whatever. It'll obey the, the original laws of the R5 and R6 that say the autofocus system must stay within the boundaries of the autofocus point that you're using.
Okay, guys, I actually go one step further because I, when I hit this AF on button, I actually want a very small autofocus point to come up. So let's assign that as well. So let's go in. I guess that was there. Let's go find it. There's autofocus. Let's go in info to go into the deeper menu and see the autofocus areas right there. Let's set this to automatically use the smallest autofocus box. There is that spot autofocus. Click OK. What did I do wrong? I forgot to check it. So check it and set it. Now we're OK. Be careful when you come out of here. Hit menu and then you have to hit OK or it won't work. So now, OK, I'm getting Gumby. Oh my god, I can't get him. Hit the AF on button and hold it down. Now I have an old school autofocus area. And I get Mr. Bill's head and I can get whatever. Okay, guys. So again, in review, when I hit AF on button, I hold it down. It overrides all the menu settings and it gives me a small little autofocus point box called spot autofocus. If I don't like that, I can go change that in there and make a bigger box. For those of you who don't like the idea of double starting the autofocus, let me show you another way to set that up. Let's go into menu. Customize buttons. Let's go find AF on. Show you a second way. Okay, instead of using metering and autofocus start, right down here, there's another AF on called switch to registered autofocus function. It's exactly the same type of deal. This is an overriding setting. And to set it further, we have to go into, again, detailed set by hitting the info button. And here's exactly the same menu. It's a little different order, but we'd, let's set it up. So autofocus area, check it and set it. Check it and set it. Let's set it. Let's use a little bigger autofocus box this time. Let's use the single autofocus point box. That one's set. Whole area tracking, turn that off, right? That's the whole point of this. We have to turn off detection and tracking. Check it and set it. I forgot to check it. And there's subject to detect check it and turn this off to nothing or it won't work great menu okay got to go out like that and now exactly the same thing if i push down the af on button i have a little bit bigger autofocus box so let's get the eye of the snow owl let's get the chest of the eagle let's get that weird light pole there so great i'm in control now so up to you all right, so that's the second way. It doesn't really matter. I've found there's no difference between them, but if it makes you feel better, great. So there's two buttons I can use for autofocus. For a third one, I do the same thing with the star button, but I just put a different autofocus point on there. So let's set the star button up to do the same thing, but just choose a different autofocus point. Customize buttons. Let's go find star. There is star. Let's go into that. And there's, okay, you don't want to use, you don't want to use the, uh, the autofocus start. There's another register recall function down here. It's a computer with little arrows going through it. It's a little bit harder to use this, but it works just fine. Let's call that up. Let's, whoops, let's go into it. Another detailed set. Go into that by hitting the info button. And it's the same menu, but all of these are checked by default. So we have to uncheck them all. Remember, these are all overriding settings. They will override whatever you have set up in the menu. So this one works fine. You just have to uncheck all these things. Because if you leave them checked, then when you push that button down, these settings will become alive. AF area, so that's one we want to do. And I usually set it up to this expanded AF around. Great. Check in and set it. Whole area tracking. We want to turn that off. That's the whole point of setting these buttons up like this. And they're subject to detect. We want to turn that off. Great. And keep going down. Eye detection. We already have that set up. There's no reason to have that on here. You can, if you wanted to, you could leave it. Here's stickiness setting. We can turn. We got to turn that off. I forgot to check it. An eye detection off. AF operation off. There we go. So let's get out of here. Menu. Be careful getting out, and then hit OK. 
Great. So now my AF on button gives us a single autofocus point box. My star button gives us a single autofocus point with a round with other helper boxes around, uh, which is useful. You can even do birds in flight when they come off the perch on this. All right, guys, that's it. That's all there is to it. My camera is ready to go birdie now. I have three different autofocus methods turned on. Let's review them. Most of the time, I'll just be using the shutter button, half press the shutter to start the autofocus system. What is the autofocus system? Settings. So I have subject detection on, I have subject tracking on, and I toggle the eye autofocus on and off by using the depth of field button on the front. That's it. I'm ready to go. If I'm in the bushes and this thing is having trouble, like if I want to get if I want to get Mr. Bill, let's go for Mr. Bill there. There's no way we can get Mr. Bill in any of these settings I have. I'm toggling the MFN button, toggling between my autofocus points. Can that one get Mr. Bill? Nope. It's got grabbing Mr. Bill. It's grabbing the L. What do we do? What do we do, guys? Hit the AF on button. Now that gives us a small autofocus box. And when I half press the shutter button, it starts up the autofocus but remember, I have detection and tracking turned off, so it's not going to go outside the boundaries of that box and look for anything. So I can get Mr. Bill just fine, right? If I need something a little bigger, I hit the star button, and now I have this box. We can get Gumby with it. Again, when I half press the shutter button, start up the autofocus, nobody is going outside the perimeters of that box. The autofocus system is looking only in the box, and that's the way you need it sometime. All right, guys, that will do it. My camera is set up, ready to go. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, what's that? I hear some of you saying you want me to show you how to set up dual back button autofocus. I don't like it. I don't like hitting these little buttons. When you're in the power position, the only way I can hit the AF on button is with this part of my thumb. That's called the IP joint, interphalangeal joint. I have to hit it down. Sometimes I can hit it. Sometimes I can't. I don't like that, guys. But if you want me to show you, I'm going to show you right now. Here we go. All right, guys, here it is. Dual back button autofocus. Really simple. What does it mean? Dual back button means we're going to use these back buttons to start the autofocus system up. And the front shutter button here is just going to take the picture. So we have to turn autofocus start off the front shutter button, which is step one. No problem. Go into menu, customize buttons under the little camera. We don't even have to go anywhere. We're right on the orange dot is right on the shutter button. Go into it, click set, and just we're on metering and start. What is metering, by the way? If you're shooting in automatic modes, the camera will look at the scene and set the exposure triangle for you. Remember, we're all in manual here. We're not using metering, so it doesn't matter to us. But if you go over to this next setting in the middle, metering start, but notice there's no autofocus start. AF start, we don't want that with dual back button autofocus. We got we to gotta take that off, the shutter button. So now watch what happens. If I want to get, uh, let's see... If I want to get the eagle who's blurry, nothing's happening. See the box is not turning blue. It's not starting the autofocus system. So if I hit the AF on button, well, the way we have it set up, it's not starting autofocus either. Because remember, I just set up, set it up through the registry recall function. Uh, but let's set up back button now. So let's set up this AF on button. Let's go in here little camera, customize buttons. Let's find the AF on button. There it is. Let's go in here and let's go right up to the top. Remember I said all the way to the top and all the way to the left is the default setting. And the default setting is to meter and hey, there it is. Start the autofocus system up. Great. So now if I say okay and I press down the AF button, you can see it trying to look for stuff like the brown owl. Push it down. We're locked on. Now I can push the shutter button, take the picture. As long as I hold that back button down, it will start the autofocus. And we can go, to, like this one is closer to us, like the eagle is closer to the camera. It's out of focus, but now it's in focus. As long as I hold that AF on button down, it's focusing, focusing, focusing on the eagle. How about the pole? Pole's pretty hard. Yep. 
it's trying on the pole. Nope, let's go back to eagle. See that? But the key is my thumb is holding it down. And realistically, this is not the way you shoot. You shoot like this. So I have to put use this part of my thumb, my IP, anterior part of my IP joint to hold it down. And I mean, it's okay. Maybe your hands are different size than mine, but... All right, so that's one way to do it, all right? Um, we can leave the autofocus boxes so you can still toggle between them and you just start autofocus like this. Okay, that's one way to do it. There's a zillion ways to do this, but now let's set up the star button to do the same thing, only we'll make the star button so it always has the small spot autofocus box with no tracking, no recognition on. That's the way I would do this. Customize buttons. Let's go find the star. There it is. Let's go back to the default because we have to start the autofocus. Those register recall functions, they don't start the autofocus up. So we can't use them here. And I hear some of you saying, uh, well, wait a minute. You already use metering and start autofocus on the AF on button. You can use it twice. It's a different AF start button here. So it'll be just fine. So let's hit detail. Now we're on it. Let's hit detailed set by hitting the info button. And great. Set this button up however you want. It's already going to start up the autofocus. What do you want it to do? It's up to you. Let's go AF area. I would say put a spot focus here. There's your autofocus methods or areas or autofocus points. For goodness sakes, Canon, can't we just name them one thing? I call them autofocus boxes. Spot autofocus, great. But here's the key, because if that's all I do, watch what happens. Let's show you what happens. If I, that's all I do, and now I hit the star button, great, we got my spot autofocus box, but it still has subject detection recognition on, so it's it's got pokey down there. It's going all over the place. Even though I have a spot, it goes outside the perimeters of the spot box and basically erases it. So that's not going to do us any good. So let's go back into menu, customize buttons. Let's go find it. There it is. Let's go back. Go back into detailed set. And let's, for goodness sakes, let's turn off subject tracking. Check it and set it. Check it and set it off so it won't follow the subject. And now let's turn off. So, and now let's turn off subject detection. We don't want it trying to detect anything because if it tries to detect, it goes outside the perimeters of the autofocus box. Check it and now let's set it to off. Follow these out so it works. Great, now we go back to our scenario. Let's say we got a this flexible zone here. I'm trying to find Gumby. Okay, can't find Gumby. I'm pressing the AF on button. Okay, it's not working. If I hit the star button now, we have a good old fashioned autofocus box and it's not going outside the perimeters of that little spot autofocus box. We can get the eagle. I have to hold this down now. I've got to hold that thing down. This one's not so easy to hit with the IP joint of your thumb. That's why I don't like back button focusing. But nevertheless, there we go. So. To recap, dual back button autofocus. I have it set up so if you push the AF on button, it starts up the autofocus. Who's controlling the, what members of the autofocus system will start up? Main menu is. It'll take those settings from the main autofocus menu. So we have, under number one, we have subject detection on to animals, and we have whole area tracking servo to auto so we have subject detection subject tracking on and that's exactly what this will do but to start that stuff up we can no longer half press the shutter we have to push the AF on button great now everything is started up I don't like that autofocus point I just hit the MFN button and we go to the next one okay start up the autofocus does that one work any better I don't know but see see how it just see how our autofocus box disappears that's because it, we have tracking and detection on, and that's that's normal for this thing. And it's it's marvelous. Uh, most of the time, no problem with it. All right, guys, so there you go. And uh, you can set those two buttons up a million different ways. All right, guys, that'll do it for this video. Any questions, leave them below. I know it was a long video. 
I am going to turn around and do a really fast version of this. Really fast, it'll probably be like 30, 40 minutes. But I'll do a speed version of this as well. But leave me any questions down below and I'll get those answered for you. And I hope you like the video. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'm almost at 1,000 subs, so I'm really happy about this. The uh, channel seems to be growing quite nicely, and I'm super happy about that. So please consider subscribing. See you in the next video.